what key is that, Kaylee? And B flat. Okay, cool. So you're the piano man, you do what you want. It's okay if we go two minutes over. Let's start time. Can I, Ryan? All right. Why are you being weird? Hang on. Guys. All right, guys. Guys, just me. I don't want to stress you. You're stressing me. Okay. <laughs> you guys do okay. It's all good. Okay, okay Logan. Ready? Logan, why don't you come with me? Come here. Because I need you. Okay, we just plugged in. Why are you like? I can't come. What? I can't come. Go. Okay, if you feel good. You feel good? No, but it is. What about that song? stand and just put it over there. A little, like, actually, like, in front of the piano. Kaylee, just... No, I'm moving mine over so that it doesn't block the pew. Because this is where everyone's going to be standing, so it's going to look weird if we have everything in front. Don't pull your eyes at me.
minor on that one? C7. Or is it? What one? Oh, no, it's the next part. Next part, okay. And I will It doesn't. No, look, it, like, it physically does. You may be seated. We have gathered this morning for the memorial service for Mr. Claude Dishman, who passed away October 30th at the age of 83. We're thankful that all of you are here, and we're honored to have Reverend Mark Brady from the Park Valley Church sharing the pulpit uh, today. We're also looking forward to eulogies from David Dishman and Ryan Dishman as part of this service. And uh, we are thankful that Ryan, Kaylee, and Colton will be uh, providing the music today. And we thank you musicians for, for that. Thank you very much. 
I would ask that we would begin the service with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for Claude Dishman. We give you thanks for his life. We give you thanks for his life as a husband and a father and a grandfather and as a friend. He's touched each of us in different ways. And we come together with mixed emotions today. We, we certainly have a sense of sadness for having lost our friend. And we've had a sense of sadness for a year or two or three now as, as we have seen dementia taking part of our beloved Claude away from us gradually. It has been difficult to watch. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort us today as scripture is read and as songs are sung, and that all point us to Claude's faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're going to talk about many of Claude's wonderful qualities today, but it's not in any of those wonderful qualities or accomplishments or his fine career that we trust for his salvation. For he placed his faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus Christ gave himself up on the cross for Claude and for all who follow as believers in Jesus Christ. And so that is what we claim for Claude's salvation, and we celebrate that today. Let this service be one that brings comfort to family and to friends, but also brings joy as we remember Claude and as we remember his faith and gives us encouragement and focuses our minds on the need for a relationship with you that is possible through your son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.
goodness of God.
You may be seated. I would like to welcome to our pulpit Reverend Mark Brady from the Park Valley Church. We're honored to have you here, Mark, and we look forward to hearing your word from God's message. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark. How can you not get excited about Jesus Christ when you hear worship like that? Thank you guys so much. Mm -hmm. Kaylee and Ryan, I know your grandfather was just smiling in heaven hearing those songs. And God was preparing you guys years ago um, to worship today. So thank you for leading us. Thank you for your kindness and your love through the years. You guys are amazing. When I, when I think about the Bible, I think about the, it's the GPS for our lives. So anything that we have going on in our lives, we can go straight to the word of God. And um, the family wanted me to share some scripture to you. So this is God speaking to me today speaking to you, and I just hope it's a blessing to everyone here in this room. In Psalms 121, it says a song of the ascents, and it says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Question mark. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day by day, nor moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forever. So that's God's promise, and that's something we can hold tightly on to today. And I am so thankful to be here today. I love this family. And um, just blessed to be here. And, and so um, without, without sacrifice, there's really no benefit when you think about that. And when you think about the most precious resource that we have is our time. And I've always said, how do you spell love? It's T-I-M-E. So by you sacrificing your most precious resource by pouring into this family today, that says it all. And we don't have the words to say, but showing up says it all. So thank you for being here. 
And so Sandy and David, Lisa, Jeff, Bev, and Art, I've been praying for you guys this week. Um, it was an honor and privilege to be by your dad's bedside, to be able to pray with him in Winchester. Um, I'm just thankful for that opportunity. And I got to be able to hang out with the boys and, and Kaylee and just, I don't know, just celebrate your dad's life. So what an honor that is. And then for all the grandchildren, Ryan and Kaylee and Logan and Megan and Jay and Jared and Jacob and April and William, and nine great-grandchildren. I mean, that's crazy, the legacy that Claude leaves us. You know, after the dust settles, Sandy, I said that a little bit earlier, um, just give us a phone call if you need, if you just want to chat or if you want prayer. And there's an amazing ministry called Grief Share. And it's going to be starting up in January. And I don't know when that time of grieving will begin for you in that process, but I just want you to know that ministry is there at the church. And just let me know if, when you're ready, and we'll be there for you. I love spending time with Claude at Park Valley Church. Claude was my cheerleader. Pastor Mark knows this. As in, when you're in ministry as a pastor, sometimes you feel like you're on an island. And when you have cheerleaders and encouragers in your life, you sort of, you know, you glean from those people. And, and Claude was that for me. He was my encourager. I learned a lot from Claude. I learned a lot from Claude by when he was coming to our men's Bible studies. And Billy Roberts is here today, and he was part of that group. And, and Claude started bringing his son David with him. That spoke volume to me that a father loved his son enough to take him to a Bible study. So I learned a lot from that. And a fun story about, about Claude, I was doing some hospital visits probably about nine months ago over here at Heathcote Hospital. And I'm walking around. We had, I had three people to visit from our church. And I'm walking around through the rooms. And I, I hear this, hey, Pastor Mark. And I turned around, and there's Claude. <laughs> Claude was sitting in a room, sitting on his bed. He said, come here, Pastor. I said, absolutely. And so I go walking in, and Claude says, Sandy's not here, but I think you should give me a ride home. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> I said, Claude, that would be awesome. But I don't know if I can take you home. And the nurse, his nurse was sitting right there. I said, Claude, if you can ask your nurse if it's okay if I take you home, I'll pull my truck up, we'll get it, and I'll take you home. So he looked over at the nurse and said, no, we can't do it. His wife's going to be coming. <laughs> I said, sorry, Clyde, I'm letting you down, bro, but it's good. It's all good. You know, I think the greatest, the greatest gift that Claude leaves us is to love two things that God tells us to do, and it's to love God and love people. And, um, you know, the GPS for our lives, the Bible, it says in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, Jesus replied, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So I think if we took those two incredible verses... And we leave here today as changed people to go out in this world, to be the light in this world. We can make an incredible difference in this world just by loving God and loving people. And that's what Claude would want from each one of us. Because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there's a lot of division in this world right now. But we as a family today can go out and make a difference for God's kingdom just by loving God and loving people. So I just want to share really quick three things. We'll have Pastor Mark come up and give us an incredible message and some readings. But um, life is really, really short when you think about it. Life is short. I'm 62 years old. I can still remember playing football 50 years ago in my front yard in Valencia, California. I can still smell the grass playing football with my brother. And, and, but here I am, 62 years old, and life has just gone by just like that. And it says in scripture in James 4, 14, how do you know what will happen tomorrow? For your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. So that's our lives. Our lives are really, really short. So what that tells me is I don't have time to be bitter. I don't have time to hold grudges. And I don't have time to gossip. And God has an appointment for all of us. You know, God knows the day, the hour, and the minute, and the second that we're all going to be born. And then God's got that plan when he's going to take us home. God knows that day, that hour, and the minute, and the second he's going to take us back to be in his presence. So we all have an appointment. And we've said, and it's probably said at this church also, that the mortality rate still hovers at 100%. Mm -hmm. You can laugh about that. That's funny. 
the mortality rate still hovers at 100%, okay? So, you know, this is something that we're all going to have to get used to and experience. A big part of living is dying. What do you think about that? I know it sounds weird, but in Scripture, the GPS for our lives, it says in Hebrews 9.27, it is in the plan that all men die once, and after that they will stand before God and be judged. So that tells me one day we're going to be standing before God, whether we know him or not. And I would say you get to know him before you meet him face to face, okay? Because we're going to be a believer in him someday. And I would say today is the day that you begin to believe in him if you don't. And I think he's going to ask us a few questions. What did you do with my son? What did you do with my son? I sent my son to walk on this earth for you. I sent this son to die on the cross for you. I sent this son to be buried for you. I sent this son to be resurrected three days later for you. So what are you doing with my son? I love you so much. I sent you the, the most precious gift. And I think the second question is, what did you do with your stuff? What did you do with your stuff? God has blessed us here in Northern Virginia. We are blessed to have beautiful homes you know, incredible resources. God has just blessed us. But what are we doing with the things that he's given us? Are we hoarding it for ourselves or are we using it for God's kingdom? Are we using our homes for maybe Bible studies or inviting our neighbors over for coffee or dessert or for dinner? So the things that God gives us, these possessions, the stuff that we collect our whole lives, God wants us to use it for his kingdom. He wants to use those things to be able to pour into people. So it all belongs to him and we're just managers of this stuff because you can't take it with you. So what are you doing with your things? What are you doing with your stuff? stuff? And then God doesn't give us affluence for ourselves, for our egos. He gives us influence of people that we can pour into and build relationships with. That's what this church is doing here in this community. That's what our church down the road on 15 is doing. We're trying to build relationships with people through love. And it's the best job ever. So God gives us all these influences in our lives to be able to move his kingdom forward. And we all have an appointment. We need to be ready for it. And then point number two is relationships are more important than accomplishments. Relationships are more important than accomplishments. Accomplishments end up being forgotten, but it's relationships that last. I went to Liberty University. I remember walking on the campus for the first time, and I was looking at all the names on the buildings. And I was asking students, well, whose name is that on that building? Nobody knew. At one point, that person had influence. That person had accomplishments, but they go by the wayside. Because accomplishments are forgotten. It's the relationships that last. And that's so evident here in the room today that the relationship that you have with Claude means a lot. And I would say one other thing today, too, you know, we work really, really hard here in Northern Virginia. You know, a lot of us commute on 66, spending our whole life working for a defense contractor, serving the military, whatever we're doing. And I think we can work our 20, 25 years. And I think, and I'm speaking for myself, that I can let those 25 years go and find out, wow, I go to my retirement party, they give me a gold watch, give me a slice of cake, then they kick me out of my cubicle. But you know what? Who's waiting there for you after you do that? It's your family. So I would say today, go home and make that phone call. Go home and hug your family today and tell them you love them. Because don't let that, don't neglect our family because they're the most important thing that we have. And they've been around a lot of people right before they're gonna pass as being the care pastor at my church. And every time I'm at a hospital, just sitting with a family, watching somebody struggle and labor right before God takes them home. Those people are not asking for their bowling trophies. They're not asking for their stock portfolios. They're not asking for their certificates. What are they asking for? They're asking for their family. That's what Claude wanted. Claude wanted to be circled by his family. So that's the most important thing, is your family is your legacy, your family is your primary responsibility. So go home and hug your kids today. Tell your spouse you love them today because life is short. And the key is don't wait till the end of your life to figure that one out. Claude did not neglect that. He knew what was important in his life. And then the last thing I wanna share with you, death is just the beginning. The good definition of uh, life is preparation for eternity. 
God is preparing all of us here in this room to spend eternity with Jesus and all of us together. So I've always said this is the dress rehearsal that we're going through right now. And God's saying you all better get along together. You might as well love each other because you're going to be together for a long time. Eternity is a long time. And it says in Scripture, and I love this so much, and this is what, this is what Claude experienced when he closed his eyes on last time here on earth and he opened them and he was in the presence of Jesus Christ. But in Re Revelation 21.4, he will wipe all their tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. So my question for you, and Pastor Mark is probably going to have the same question for you because he loves the Lord and he loves people. He's in the people, Jesus pushing ministry. But are you ready for that appointment? Are you ready for that appointment? Because life is short. And I'm just going to share some scriptures. It's from the book of Romans. And I just want you to think about these scriptures. And you guys can go to your Bible when you get home and read them. They're amazing. They're called the Romans Road. And in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned, and they fall short of God's glory standard. Okay? So that tells me that we are all good sinners. We are all good sinners because we're born with sin nature because of what Adam and Eve did, okay? And how do I know we're born with that sin? Well, I've got seven grandchildren. And when all seven of them were born, I did not have to teach them as their grandfather how to lie, cheat, or steal. They just knew how to do it inerrantly, in right? They just know how to do it. I didn't have to circle them up and say, okay, guys, here's how you lie, cheat, or steal. On the count of three, one, two, three. They just know. But Romans uh, 6.23, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That gets me excited. That Christ died on the cross for all of us here in the room. He did the heavy lifting for us. He did it for you and I in this room. And then Romans 5, 8, but God commandeth his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for everyone here in this room. He loves you this much. In Romans 3, 23, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, you know, for years I've been, I've been doing a lot of funerals. I've been blessed to do funerals and, and just build relationships with people. God's been so gracious to my wife and I. But we've always figured out at Park Valley Church and here at Haymarket Baptist, you know, we don't, we don't believe it's about a religion. It's never about a religion. Religions can muddy up the waters. We don't believe it's about a religion, a building, a denomination. It's about a relationship. So as Pastor Mark shares with you, just ponder and think about how's your relationship with Jesus Christ? It's a good day to examine our walk right now because he's a good, good father. We heard those incredible worship songs that just set the table for that relationship with Jesus Christ. So would you bow your heads? I'll pray for us real quick. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you for Claude's amazing giving heart. Lord, I thank you that he was my cheerleader, that he was my encourager. And looking out in this room, I truly believe he did that for everyone here in this room today. And so, Lord, I just pray that uh, through the rest of the message today, Lord, that you'd be glorified. And Lord, that people would choose you instead of the world. And we thank you that it's all about relationships. And the greatest relationship we can have is your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we love you. Comfort the family and just be with them. We thank you for who you are. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Appreciate it very much. The family's asked that we read Psalm 23. So hear these words of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
And now I'd like to ask David and Ryan to come and share a little bit of their experience with God. guys. It's actually, um, I had a memory when I was sitting there and watching Mark and Mark up here. Um, so my dad was a deacon at this church. And uh, I remember, Mark, I can't remember, but I think, was it every quarter or so that a deacon had to come speak or say something in front of the church? Um, something like that. Every Sunday a deacon helps in some way. Yeah, yeah. Every so, so, you know, dad, dad took that so seriously. And I remember him calling me and leaving voicemails during the week that um, he wanted some help. He, he just, he wanted to make sure that the message was exactly right. Um, you know, he took the, his faith and he was that humble um, before the Lord in that way. And it's, it's interesting because when I was younger, he was, he was uh, not that way. You know, he was very um, assertive and, and, and perhaps sometimes not so humble. Um, but it just, it really impressed me that he was that way um, as he continued his faith journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, thank you guys so much for being here, and, and Kaylee and, and Ryan and, and uh, Colton, thank you guys for, for seeing. I know that Dad, um, the, the number of times that Dad would sit and listen to them sing and play music, and he would just cry. He loved them so much. And um, I mean, even before Ryan was born, um, my dad was a heavy smoker. He'd smoke three packs a day or something like that. And he tried to quit smoking before, but I told him that he was going to have a grandson. And um, he literally said, I'm going to quit smoking. And I think that day he quit smoking. He never smoked again. Um, it was just uh, amazing the love that he had for every single one of the grandkids before they even were on the earth, before they were even born. Yeah. And that's the kind of love that he shared throughout my life. So I'm going to read some words. Um, hopefully I don't get choked up here. Um, so we, we, we received a lot of cards from several, several of you here and just very thankful for that and, and others. And uh, one card stuck out to me. Um, it said something that I thought was pretty profound. Um, I really hadn't thought of it before. Um, but it said, Claude, my dad, had a servant's heart. And um, again, I hadn't thought of it uh, that way. It's just, to me, it was my dad, you know, and that's just what he did. But he would do things like uh, rebuild an engine for a dad and his daughter for her car so that she could go to school or work. He'd spend Saturdays doing that for a month or two, however long it took. Um, he re he'd re rebuild a tractor engine for a friend of his or help replace a tractor manifold. <laughs> he'd help folks with legal issues, tax issues, pensions, retirement. I mean, he would just... He would help in all ways, and God blessed him with a, with a good education, and he led a finance and accounting group at a good size uh, company before he got into sales. So he had a lot of knowledge, and he shared that with people. Um, I sometimes look at that, and I, you know, what a, what a measure of a man um, to look up to, and, and a lot of times I feel like I, I fall short, but it's, um, you know, what a, what a leader, what a dad to do it. Yeah, he would just go out of his way to do these things, and he was cheerful in doing it. It came so so easily to him. Uh, you know what a you know what a what a memory to and what a way to lead me and and our family and grandchildren and, and, and those kinds of things. So it was nice to reflect on that, and um, also think about how he grew in his faith and served the Lord. I mean, before the dementia, and that's been the last couple of years, as Pastor Mark said. Um, he was always trying to help out here at the church. For example, he, he played Santa Claus, which I, I never thought anybody would get him to play Santa Claus. I mean, to, to get into a red suit like that. I just, uh, but it was great. I mean, it was, it was such a blessing. Uh, he'd help coordinate Bible studies. He'd call me like every Saturday. Dave, you going to Bible study with me? And he did that. I mean, Pastor Mark, you mentioned that. And he's been doing that for years, for years. And, um, and I'd go, and I would go with him. 
you know, he'd volunteer for Haymarket Day that we have here. Or he was a deacon, as I said. Um, and I could go on. There, there are just so many things. Um, and just like he served others, he was, he was so thoughtful of me as I grew up. He always had my back. And he, he, even if I didn't know it or didn't want to face uh, consequences of, of bad choices I made, he was there. And one story comes to mind, and again, there are many of these, but this is just one. Um, when I was in middle school, I got in a fight, and you know, basically what happened is I had a, a buddy of mine that just before class, math class, and he stole his kid's pencil, and, and he threw it to me. And um, I really wasn't into this, but the pencil went under my desk, and um, I was going to pick it up, and this kid just starts choking me. So before I even knew it, I hit him a few times. And, um, you know, of course, we had to go to the principal's office, and um, he calls my, calls my mom, you know. I want to spank, you know, your son because he really hurt this, this, uh, this child here, which I understand. And, um, and she said, well, you better talk to his dad before you do that. You, you might just want to talk to Claude. And so that's what he did. He, uh, he talked to my dad. And um, he told him, hey, I want to, I want to, I want to spank David. He's, he's hurt this, this young man. And my dad told him, if you spank him, I'm going to spank you. I mean, literally, that's what he said. Don't touch that boy. <laughs> and, and if you knew my dad back then, that's, he was direct. He was very direct. Um, and he was protective of me. And um, then in, in, in the next few things that he said, and I, and I don't know if I have this exactly right, but it, it just, it, it's what really made me a lot of who I am today. Um, he told the principal he wanted to say, you know, he taught me to defend myself. And he knew that I wasn't looking for trouble. Um, if anyone was going to do the disciplining, it was going to be my dad. And he didn't think I really did anything wrong. And that was the end of it. I mean, that was the end of the discussion with the principal. But what really impressed me about this was my dad had no idea what I did. He, he didn't know. He didn't know if I started the fight or didn't or, or what have you. Um, but he believed in me. Uh, and that belief was all the time. He was confident I would do the right thing even when I didn't do the right thing. And when I didn't do the right thing, it gave me the desire to want to because I wanted to please him. I mean, what a great leader my dad was. And his confidence in me gave me confidence in me. There are a lot of lessons there. I recognize that generally as a kid. As I've gotten older, as I said, it's just been foundational. Uh, in my growth as a person. And he was just a great dad. So it leads me to a final thought or two. Um, something that's given me hope is the fact that when we talked to the nurse the day we visited the memory care unit at the nursing home facility not that long ago. This is the day before he passed. And the nurse said, the prior several days, my dad had been praying throughout the day for the last several days he was praying. That struck me. I mean, it just struck me. My dad was pursuing the Lord in the last days of his life. Amen. And I know the Lord was with him. You know, I, th I think his prayer was for the Lord to take him. But I also think he prayed to see my mom. Just one last time. And to see his family. The last thing my dad said the day before he died, and he wasn't really saying much of anything. He was, his sodium levels were through the roof, and he was pretty much sort of in a coma type situation. My mom was trying to talk to him and get him to respond. And he opened his eyes just this once, and he said, Sandy. And he smiled. To be in so much pain, I won't get into that, but he was in a lot of pain at that time. For him to look at me and mom and smile like that, it was clear to me he was in peace in the midst of all of it. And he was letting us know it's going to be okay, just like he always had. I think his prayer was answered. He got to see, as he would say, his Sandy and his family one last time. And at that point, he was ready to go be with our Lord and Savior in heaven. Amen. Closed his eyes, and that's the last thing that he said. Amen. So what a gift that he gave me and my mom and the family 
We know he's in heaven. We know he's with our Lord and Savior. And I know his dad did the same thing. My granddad passed away when my dad was 15. It was well before I, I came about, um, but I heard a lot about it. My granddad was 43 when he died of his third heart attack. My dad always used to tell me the story, two things. One, the last bit of advice his dad gave to him right before he passed. And then what his dad said when he was actually passing right at that time. And I'll just say a few more things and then I'll, I'll get, it, get, it, get it over here to Mark. Um, my granddad spent his last year prior to passing really pouring into my dad, um, spending a lot of time with him. They would fish. They would, he would take him to work quite a lot. He introduced my dad to the Lord that year. And he had him baptized. And my granddad also pursued the Lord. And he was baptized. A year prior, the, the, the doctor told my granddad that he didn't have much time to live. That was his second heart attack. And he said, you, you might have a year if you're lucky. And he made use of that year. You know, going back to Mark, what you were saying. I mean, he knew. And he, made, he made use of it. So the last thing my granddad said to my dad and this, was, this meant a lot to him, and he told me this so many times, was, was, son, this is a few minutes before he passed away. I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be here to watch you grow up. I want you to take care of your mom, okay? And make sure you get an education. You're going to make your money with your mind, son, not your brawn. And be good to people. Money will be here long after people are dead and gone. That's the last thing my granddad said to my dad. My dad left the room, and um, my grandmother came back in. My grandmother's name was Bessie. He looked up at the ceiling, and he said, It's so beautiful, Bess. Why don't you come and go with me? He went to be with the Lord. So he gave the da my dad the same gift and our family the same gift that my dad gave me, knowing that I'm going to see him again. My dad's in heaven now with his granddad and family and friends, Sam Brittle, one of his best friends, uh, for a number of years. That was a prayer answer. And after crying, probably, I guess I'd probably <laughs> feel like it was day and night for a week, um, I started to feel a little bit lighter. As I prayed and I was thinking about that and thought, God just kept giving me, giving that to me, and the, and the blessing, and the, and, and the thoughts of He's in a better place. And even in the last moments, whether Dad knew it or not, and He probably did in some way, He gave me one of the greatest gifts. Again, knowing I'll see Him again. I'm going to share one, one last verse, and then I'll, I'll hand it over actually to Ryan. Um, this is out of John 14, another one of. Another one of my dad's favorite verses, and, and several of those that have been said are, are his favorites. He would cite them to me often. Psalm 121 or 23. This is Jesus talking. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I go now in the way you know. And then Jesus goes on to say, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. How are you guys doing? Good. You guys can say good. We can. It's a funeral, but we don't have to be... We don't have to be too sad. All right, well, my name's Ryan. Um, and my last name's Dishman for you guys that, that don't know me. I'm gonna leave this unbuttoned. Um, and I am Claude, or as I call him, Grand Grand's grandson. Um, and to expound what my dad said, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I want to thank you for the flowers. We have some flowers at the house. Um, they're really beautiful, thank you. I want to thank you guys for the cards. I don't. I didn't realize how many cards we had in the mail. Um, more cards than there are people here. So I'm thinking people that aren't here as well. But we have probably 30 cards in the dining room, and we haven't checked the mail in a week at my grandma's house. I have a feeling we probably have 30 more cards. And um, and as my dad mentioned, they're awesome to read. Um, 
some people that just knew him briefly and some people that knew him very well and, and said some really touching stories and things in there. So I thank you guys for that. I also want to thank you guys for the food. Um, anyone that brought food, if you didn't bring food, there's more than enough, I believe. So we'll have that after. And then I want to thank the two Pastor Marks. Ironically, they're both, their names are both Mark. Thank you guys for speaking. And thank you for um, the message you're about to, to give. And um, for you guys in the crowd, um, for, for coming. Because um, if it wasn't for you guys being here and celebrating his life with us, well, we would just be a lot of sad people singing songs to ourselves and crying, which we've been doing for the past three weeks. So um, it's awesome to get to spend this time with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, and thanking you from my heart, my family's heart, and, and I know my grandfather's heart as well. All right, well, get to the point after all those formalities. Um, I could tell you all about my granddad's life. I could tell you from the time he was born in 1940 until... Uh, his childhood, how cheap everything was, because God knows he told me how cheap you could get a hot dog for. Um, I could tell you about his dad passing, as my dad mentioned, very impactful for his life. I could tell you about how he got through high school. I could tell you all the fights he had in high school, the girlfriends he had. I could tell you about how he worked seven and a half years to get his college degree, working nights and having a full-time job. And um, I could tell you about all the problems that he had throughout his life before he met my grandmother and um, and how great she was and his second marriage. And um, I could tell you about that all in his career and all his accomplishments, whatever, right? I could sit here for three hours and I could give you a full presentation, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I figured I would mention it. it's a very long and lengthy thing. Um, and feel free to ask any of us, you know, if you'd like to talk to us about it after. I'm sure we would all enjoy it. Um, but instead, I'm going to tell you about the impact he had on my life. And um, that starts with my inception, my, my birth, when they found out I was going to be a thing. And, um, around February of 2000, they, they found out I was going to be born. And, um, and then there, shortly after, they found out I was going to be a boy. And the first person my dad called was my granddad. And, um, ha. Huh. I've been avoiding this. Um, the next day, I quit smoking. And um, as I tell, try to get through telling you guys some stories, uh, of course, I, read, I wrote this to where only I could read it and wrote points so my dad couldn't carry on, which is smart. Um, uh, you know, it goes to show, it, 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 it pretty much set the tone for his love for me and who he was. All right, so. Just, um, and, and, and the reason he quit smoking, my dad didn't mention this, was because he hoped to see me become a man someday. That's what he said. So highlight some of the things. I'm going to highlight some of uh, our time together and a few stories that were impactful to me and how he impacted my life. Um, you know, he, was, he was my mentor. He was my rock. So when I was about a year and a half, a half to two years old, we um, we were we moved in with them for about three years, for a short period of time while we were waiting for our, our new house to be built. Um, I believe it was a, a townhouse, off uh, next to the Harris Theater here in Haymarket. And story goes, every morning we would sip, and I was an early riser, and he was an early riser. I had the saying, uh, um, what was it? Uh, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's what he always tell me, and he lived by it. He did, um, and we'd get up every morning. I'd grab a banana. I love bananas, and he would eat a banana every morning with me. And we'd sit down at the TV, and we would sit there and we'd laugh. And I can I can picture it now, just chuckling at six in the morning before anybody else was even up. And we'd eat that banana, and then he would go to work. He wasn't retired yet. He'd come home, and he'd play with me every single night, um, and spend as much time with me as he could. And one of our favorite things to do at that time was play peekaboo. And Peekaboo and, and my, my nickname from that, from there on, was Boo. Or sometimes he called me Boo Meister or what, what have you, but I was Boo to him. Um, and we moved out after that. And as I got older, from about three ish to eight, um, he was constantly taking me on tractor rides. He, was, he taught me how to fish and shoot my first BB gun. 
how to shoot my first shotgun, how to shoot a rifle. Um, he taught me how to drive a car and a boat around seven. I was driving a, track, er, a truck around Haymarket at the age of seven, I'm sorry, um, on these very roads. And, um, and he actually, he got a boat, I think I was six years old, he got a boat for us and he told me, he said, Ryan, I'm getting this boat. He loved fishing. If you didn't know him personally or all that well or if you know him later in his life, he loved fishing, especially as a kid. It was huge for him. And he said, Ryan, when I grew up in Maryland, we used to sit there and we would, we'd go on boats out. And, um, and he said, I want to share those memories with you as while well, you're young, the age I was when I was going out on boats. And, um, and it became known as, as Boo's Boat. That's what he has. He got it painted on the back and he was so happy about it. He said, Ryan, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get it painted. And he spent so much money on getting it painted. And it was crazy. Why? Why? It was like a thousand dollars to get this thing painted on it. And it said booze boat. And it had a little um, fishing line with a, with a thing on it. And at that time, I, I, I thought it was like, grand, grand, you're crazy. You're spending a grand on this. But looking back, it's like, that's how intentional he was. Um, and uh, let's see where, okay, so um, he would do that as, uh, and he always found it, this is one thing about my granddad, he always found it really important that I had cash in my pocket. My dad has a thousand stories about this, but if my dad ever went on a date, he said, how much money do you need? And the same thing with me as a kid, he was always, because he grew up with not a lot of money, and after his dad passed away, he worked for pretty much everything he had and was, was fairly poor. He always gave me a weekly allowance, and I don't know, it's something I mentioned, because that was, that was big for him. Five bucks to me every week seemed, sounded like nothing. I couldn't even buy a toy with that. But to him, that was everything. Because, again, going back to you could buy a whole thing of candy for a dime back in the day. So, um, But I'll go to when I was about eight. Um, set the scene. I was around eight years old. And my family had just recently gone through a bankruptcy, um, which um, some people don't like to talk about. It really wasn't a too terribly bad of a deal. Um, my dad had several diseases at that time, and it caused him to have to go on short-term disability. Um, and our family, we were just struggling generally as a family. Um, at this time, we had moved into a townhouse that we rented, and we were tied on fin finances because we were going to be building a new home, trying to get things straight and recover and recuperate that. Um, and we had to move. So this made me the new kid at school. Um, and... Well, as you know, third grade can be brutal in many ways. And at this time, Abercrombie was a very popular clothing brand. Um, if you guys probably have heard of it, and if you haven't, it is. Um, especially at that time. And I wanted Abercrombie jeans at this time. Every kid had Abercrombie jeans. So I went to my granddad, and as I would, I would say uh, nervously, and in the sweetest voice I could, I'd say, you know, could I ask you a question, Grand Grand? And he had this, this lazy boy, and I'd come up beside him. And he'd, he'd always sit with like one leg on the side. <laughs> Anyways. Um, and, I, and he knew exactly where this was going. And he knew exactly what this meant. I wanted something. <laughs> he chuckled. And I can hear him chuckle now. And he said, all right, what do you want? And I told him I needed a pair of jeans. And I asked him if I could get a pair of jeans from Abercrombie. And he said, well, how much is it? Because he was the kind of granddad, he didn't want me to feel left out. He didn't want me not to feel like I didn't fit in. Because he was probably just going to say, here's you know, what normal jeans would cost for an eight-year-old, 20 bucks. And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, how about we just go get those jeans for you? I'll go with you. So we, one day we went shortly thereafter, and he took me to Fair Oaks Mall. And he didn't just give me one pair of jeans. He got me, like, uh, he got me three pairs of jeans, I remember. Three pairs of jeans, a few T-shirts, and a, and a hoodie, sweatshirt. And these jeans costed $80 or $90 a piece for an eight-year-old. For an eight-year-old. But it didn't matter to him at all. It didn't, it didn't phase him. Now, if you know my granddad, um, I'm sure you know, he, he made a joke at the time. He asked if it would make my breakfast for me or if it would do my homework or something like that for 80 bucks a pop. But um, it wasn't money that mattered at all. Um, and it sounds like what everyone's thinking, you were a spoiled kid who was eight years old. And you're totally right. He did spoil me a lot. He loved me. And that was one of his ways of showing it. But, um, and this sounds small, it was just so important to him, this little, st these, these jeans. Because he knew that if I, if, because he knew when he didn't have a dad, he, um, 
he didn't get the things that everyone else wanted. He wanted to make sure that I felt confident and that I could go into school and not, and not be made fun of and, and those sort of things. And that's just how intentional he was with loving me um, and just wanting better for me than what he could have in his life. Um, and this wasn't all he was intentional about. Um, my parents and I were talking and we, he never missed a sports game. And I can actually say that. That's not like, a, that's not like a, oh, my granddad was at every sporting event. He was emphatic about being at every single sporting event I ever had. From the age of two or three playing at James Long Park Soccer, from to the time I, I finished high school, he came to every sporting event I had. Not only every sporting event, he came to every practice I had. Every practice. He would call my mom almost every evening, and he would say, when's Ryan's practice? Pick me up. Pick me up. And we have to go get him. Because if we did, we got him every time. And, um, and that was so important to him. And that's just how intentional he was. Um, and, um, and he was always there for me, much like you heard from my dad. Um, he just had this feeling to him, this intensity. And as time, this intensity sweetened over time, especially once the time I got to know him, to this love, and he loved us all. And for him, it was all or nothing. And he was all in all the time. And that was big. Um... So I'm going to get into one more story. I try to close it off. I, I had such a hard time writing this thing because you want to tell, like, like I said, an hour long story. Um, but that house we were waiting to build, we moved into it at the end of the summer of fifth grade, going into sixth grade. And I don't know if, if he talked to you. I don't know if he talked to my dad, but he made it a priority every single morning to get me out of bed at eight o'clock and to take me to McDonald's with him. We'd go hang out with his friends. He taught me how to golf. He taught me how to fish around that time. I got to know who my granddad was. I got to know who he was. And um, this is where my notes end, end up because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what to write about this, so I'm going to speak off the dome. But um, he taught me, we would go to McDonald's. He had a group of friends there. He would take me to Bible study Wednesday morning, 7 o'clock. And, um, and he dragged my dad along sometimes too on those Wednesday mornings. We had Saturday Bible study here. He'd take me to that. We're down at McDonald's, he would, uh, he would sit there and we'd talk. And I was the kind of kid, you may not notice it now, I was, the, I was the kind of kid who would sit in his room. I'd draw for five hours, I'd play Legos for five hours, I wouldn't talk to anybody for five hours. I was such an introverted kid. And if you knew anything about my granddad, you knew he was not an introverted person. <laughs> he was not. He filled the room. He filled the room with... Um, with with life and love and happiness and um and even through the bad times he still tried to do that as best he could um and he taught me how to do that he took a kid who was not confident in himself he took a kid who didn't believe in himself who couldn't speak up couldn't talk to girls i couldn't i hardly wanted to raise my hand in class and he taught me how to talk to people how to love people and he taught me um just ultimately what what I've come to learn is to be a servant for Christ and taught me how to be a man. And he was so, as I said, he was a mentor to me. He was so fundamental in, in my upbringing and who I can say I am today. Um, and that I cherish those, those two or three summers with him. Um, he, I, could, I could tell you a thousand stories of those two or three summers. Um, but that was the overall theme of it. Um, and I guess, I guess I'll close. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's really to say I could, I don't want to ramble too much. I'm a rambler. Um, but, uh, but you know, my granddad was a very good person. Um, he was very good to me. Uh, he got very much sweeter the last 15 years of his life. He turned out to be a very, a good man at the end of, the, uh, of his life. And he got to know Christ. And if it wasn't for him, I can't say I, would know Christ. I can't say I would have the work ethic I have. I, I wouldn't have the confidence that I have to be the person I am today. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes to his character um, and as his character developed and who he became and who he was in Christ and who he taught me to be in Christ. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, I don't have a, a fancy Bible verse. I was looking for some. I was I can't get through a Bible verse. I'm going to be really honest with you guys. I, I can't get through it um, because it just hits me so hard. 
But um, I just want to say thank you guys for coming. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Um, and yeah, so if you guys would all bow your heads, close your eyes, please. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today, Lord, with a hurting heart. God, we come to you with tears in our eyes trying to hold back, trying to hold back these tears, Lord. And God, we come to you with, with heavy hearts, Lord, but softened hearts. God, we thank you for the time that, that my grandfather had on this, this, this earth, Lord. We thank you for the long 83 years that he had, God, that you blessed him with. God, we thank you for the people that he touched, like my dad spoke on. God, we thank you for the lives that he impacted. Lord, I personally thank you for putting him in my life to be a mentor. God, I thank you for putting him in my life, Lord, that I came to know Christ, and he was such a pivotal role and pivotal character in that, in that, in that story and that development. And Lord, I just hope that, God, I know he's in heaven right now. God, one of the last things I remember sitting there with him, and you know this, Lord, and it was very special to just us. God, but I sat there and we prayed together, Lord, on, his, on, his, on the bed in the hospital. And God, I know that if he didn't accept Christ before that, I made sure he was going to accept Christ then. And I, but I, I know before then this heart was there. God, and I know that you, can, you found him in that spot because he didn't, there wasn't much time left after that that he passed away. God, I just want to thank you for everyone here, Lord. I want to thank you for being such a good father. And Lord, I pray that as just as Grand Grand would want now, now that he's not suffering, and Lord, he's with you, God, I would pray that, that someone here, Lord, that they would find Christ. Amen. God, that there would be a change in someone's heart. Yeah. Lord, that a heart would be softened. Yes. God, that a, plant, a seed would be planted, Lord, and that you would come through, God, because I know you can. I know you can because you've told us in your word. And God, I, I just want to thank everyone for coming here, Lord. I say this all in your son's name, Jesus. And I'm going to do this because I've always wanted to. And everyone said? Amen. There we go. Amen. Thank you, guys. family specifically requested that we read John 3, 16 through 18. Here are these words that uh, come out of the teaching that Jesus had with Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his world into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. It has been difficult uh, watching Claude decline. Uh, dementia just creates all sorts of problems and it comes gradually and uh, it starts showing up and the person starts behaving just a little bit different. It still seems like the same person, but then little few things go wrong and aren't right. But, you know, we can sort of hide those for a while or tell ourselves, no, no, he just Claude had a bad day. But then as it became more and more, it, it was obvious to Sandy and the family and then close friends that, you know, he was really in significant decline. Um, it's amazing to me that he still had his wits about him. He, he, at times, he was still really bright and even clever and mischievous. Um, <laughs> He was over at the Legacy. He managed to notice that one of the staff members had placed their car keys somewhere, and he managed to get their car keys and talk his way out of the front door and get in that staff member's car, I guess by clicking the button, and take off in the car. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, it takes a lot of intelligence to do all those things. It's sort of a breakout there. But it, it, it's difficult, though, and dangerous, and dangerous. So it, it has been, it's been difficult, but we are glad that his suffering is over. Now you've already heard that he had a tough life growing up. He didn't grow up with a silver spoon, uh, losing his dad when he was very young. 
The family moved around from Tennessee to Maryland, uh, then Arlington. He ended up in Arlington. and He was in the Air Force for a while and had an injury and had a, a, an honorable discharge. But I'm sure that was very disappointing to him to have to leave. And then his first marriage ended. And I'm certain that was, that was very disappointing and difficult to him. But I'm glad that he went to Plaza 7 in Falls Church and saw Sandy and asked her to dance. And uh, it took a little persuading, but eventually she decided she'd dance with him. And then, and then they married. And uh, 49, 49 years, right? 52 years. Okay. I stand corrected on that, but um, he made a long and successful marriage with Sandy. He had a good career, a fine career, a manager and CFO of a printing company for 20 years and a salesman for U.S. Printing Inc. Company for almost 30. But at the end of your life, you know, the career goals and awards and achievements and the, the salaries, although they were certainly good and helped the family in lots of ways, they eventually pale in comparison to family. You know, it, really, it really does. Claude made that decision to accept Christ at age 14. The Bible teaches us that none of us follow Jesus perfectly, and Claude didn't. He wouldn't have wanted me to pretend like he did. But as he got older, he got more and more serious about his faith and drew closer to Christ. And he wanted to make sure that Christ was at the center of the home. And he wanted to have David and both the children, the grandchildren, to, to know about Jesus and to see that relationship. And the Lord gave him a servant's heart. You know, believing in Jesus is not only saying the words. It's certainly important to say the words, I believe in Jesus. But Claude understood it wasn't just saying the words. And so he would, could be real spontaneous in a way that he helped people. Sandy told me one day he was at McDonald's, and one of the McDonald's group just said, man, i got to get to Richmond. I don't have a way to get there. And Claude's like, oh, well, I'll take you. I hope Sandy wasn't counting on him for anything that day because suddenly he's gone taking a friend to Richmond. But he just had a servant's heart about him. And, and that's the kind of thing that the Lord wants us to do. As, as the scripture you read tells us, the two most important things... Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love, you tell me, your neighbor as yourself. And so he, he came to understand that very, very well. He joined our church in 2013 and uh, the members of the church saw Jesus in him enough to say, we'd like you to serve as a deacon. A diakonos in Greek means servant. And Claude understood what it was like to be a servant to others. He was certainly, as he was to you, Mark, he was an encourager to me. Yes, and ministry is, has a lot of glorious things. Sometimes they're difficulties. And so to have somebody in your church that lifts you up, Amen. you know, that's just a great thing. And Claude, Claude was that way with me every time I saw him. He, he always encouraged me along the way. He's had many wonderful accomplishments, but he'd be the first to tell you, I don't trust in any of those for my salvation. It is trusting in Jesus Christ and what Christ did on the cross that gives me confidence to know I'm going to know the Lord and I'll be with him after I die. I want you to listen to two more songs that Ryan, Kaylee, and Colton are going to sing for us. Um, can they remain seated for these or do you need them to stand? For the first one, I can sit. First one, sit. Second one, stand. Uh, and then I'll have a closing prayer and then the family will go. Uh, led by John Hessenauer, our usher, and by Pastor Mark uh, to the fellowship hall where you're all going to be invited to join them for lunch. So kids, come on up and lead us in song. <laughs> My dad is shaking his head because, you know, it's his song. Um, he wrote this, how old were you when you wrote this? Like 17, 19? Um, yeah, my dad wrote this song about his dad, and it's called When My Dad Talked to Me. And it's all about how he didn't listen to his dad as much as he should have when he was a young, a young boy. Um, so, yeah, 
yeah, Ryan's gonna sing a majority of this one, but we added on a verse to the end of it um, just to talk about the end of his life and the legacy that you know he left on his own. So, yeah. And also, I'm gonna do some awkward talking while I'm getting things ready. Dad, there's a story that goes along with this song that Grand Grand always told me. He told me as well. He was um, my dad had written this song. I guess he was first, second year of college, first year of college, freshman. First year. First year of college, and um, they were having a party at the house. They had a pool. Uh, my granddad loved hosting parties, and he was, like I said, a people person if you haven't found out yet. And um, dad, who was, he had a, a client that was out there. He was a friend of Don Gwaltney. Don Gwaltney, a friend of his. I believe he's passed away now, so the late Don Gwaltney. And he said, Don, I, I, uh, I have a, a song you gotta hear for my son. And it just goes to show you the type of person, you know, believing, believing in us. And um, he, he played the song for, for my dad, played the song for his, uh, his dad and, and Don Gwaltney. And Don Gwaltney sat there and he, he cried and bawled his eyes out. And, um, and um, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of song it is. But anyways, I figured I'd tell that story I was thinking about it earlier. All right.
bow with me as we close in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for Claude. We give you thanks for his marriage. We give you thanks for the love he shared with his family and with his friends and with two different churches. We're so grateful for what you did through his life. And Father, we pray now that as friends, uh, we can reach out and share a lunch with the family and share memories together. Bless our time together, Lord, and keep us focused on your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark, Can please. Can I say a prayer really quick? Oh. Is it okay if I say a prayer? Uh, okay. okay. Sure. Sorry. All right. I told my granddad I would say this, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. All right. You guys back here one more time. All right. Dearly Father, God, I want to come to you, and I feel like I feel led to do this, Lord. Um, God, if there's anybody here, we spoke on soft hearts, God. We spoke on the end of life, Lord. We're here because somebody passed away, God. And while we know that death is only temporary, Lord, that you have conquered death, God, that you have given your son for us, Lord, God, I, would feel, I wouldn't feel it would be right, Lord, if I didn't offer salvation for people here, Lord, if I didn't ask anybody if they wanted to be saved. So anybody, um, if you'd like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd ask if you would just say this prayer with me quietly to yourself. Dear Holy Father God, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm not perfect, Lord. And God, we, we've heard this message today, Lord. And God, I come to you with a soft heart, Lord. I come to you with heavy eyes, Lord, with tears in my eyes, God. And I come to you and I ask you, Lord, if you would please it. And I believe in, I believe in Jesus, God. And, and God, I, I, I believe in you, and I believe in your kingdom, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, God. I ask that you save me, God. And that I can spend time with you in an eternal heaven, Lord, in an everlasting heaven. Yes. And in a heaven that, would, that goes on forever, God, after this life. Mm. Lord, I, I ask this all in your son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark, would you go with the family and follow John Hessenow, our usher? Uh, and we'll let the family go first to the fellowship hall. The rest of us then will follow the family. Friends, please follow the family. You're all invited to the lunch.